Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome Hello to the, everybody. <laughs> welcome to the first episode of Liminal Podcast. <laughs> welcome to all the people from all the dance floors. Welcome to all the tribes, because this uh, new first episode of Liminal Podcast is actually going to be streamed through the Boom Festival channels, but also through the Unite platform and the, all the Unite network. So I would like to thank everyone for making this possible. And also I would like to thank Unite to be the ones that are keeping the beat going on. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you for joining us on this experiment. And I would like actually to bring the greetings in name of the whole Boom Festival team. I'm speaking now in the name of many people. And I would like to say that, yes, we are excited to be here now. And it has been quite a ride to, to navigate these times. And it has been quite um, a challenge to pull the brake to the plane that was taking off, because the Boom Festival is a, a very big um, organism that requires the effort, the energy, the passion, the love of so many people. And pulling the brake to that was quite uh, a challenge. And we were able to do that, not just because we understood that that was the right thing to do, but also because we knew that so many other people, so many other festivals and events and clubs, they had to shut or postpone in this case. So um, the fact uh, that we knew that we were not alone and that we are all in this together really helped. And we would like to thank you to, for being here with us now navigating these times. And we were going to be excited now to get Liminal Village ready on site in Portugal. Um, but we're compromising, like everybody is. And we're trying to make the best out of it and do this through screens virtually. And again, it was group therapy with all the team talking, talking together, uh, talking each other through this uh, over the past few months. So we came up with a compromise. And now we're here in your screens. So this series is curated by the Liminal Village team, that is the Cultural Area and Boom Festival, but also this uh, episode is possible thanks to the work of many people behind the scene, and we want to take a moment to thank all of them. You know who you are. And uh, yeah, it's been quite a process, and thank you for sticking with us through, through the continuous plan changing. And I think everybody, we are getting this collective initiation into constant changing of plans and reframing our work in different ways, in different formats, with uh, adjusting the vision to the new possibilities. And so um, this series, in a way, is part of this collective uh, challenge to reframe our work. But it's also part of a bigger strategy that Boom Festival uh, is putting into place right now to keep the connection to the people and also to share some relevant information that can be useful right now. And together with, uh, for example, the Boom Toolkit COVID-19 series that we are um, releasing on a weekly basis, on our social media channels, but also more initiatives that are still in the brewing phase and I'm not gonna mention right now what they are. But also most people have been just raving in their bedrooms by themselves. Um, and that's been great uh, for people who have enjoyed doing that. Uh, but we also thought it would be cool to add some conversation and make it open. So now the fact that this is free and open and distributed and streaming all around the world, it is an opportunity for people who don't necessarily have a ticket to a festival to also engage with us and, uh, and some of the cool people we'll have uh, with us today. And actually, I hope this is also a possibility for the boomers that uh, usually come to boom and don't come to the liminal village, maybe to take a look at what we do, who we are, <laughs> what kind of conversations we like to entertain, and also to get to know our speakers, because the speakers of this series will be from the past and future uh, programs of liminal village. 
So this was uh, the first part of the intro. Actually, now I would like to take a moment to ground and to open this portal. And I would like to invite all of you to close your eyes and take a deep breath. Feel the space that we inhabit with our bodies in this 3D dimension. And take a moment to thank the land that is nurturing us with food, with water, also with air that we breathe, allowing us to be here now. And also we take a moment to thank all the lineages of all our ancestors, to the people that took care of all the lands where we are right now, all over the world, that went through so many pandemics and wars and ups and downs along so many centuries and millennia, allowing us to be here and now. And especially I would like to thank all our ancestors that used to love to dance to the beat of the drum. We resonate with your joy and energy. And once we feel grounded in this physical body that we inhabit, we are ready to open our eyes and journey into this online reality in the ethereal space <laughs> and open the portal for this first episode of the liminal podcast here we go <laughs> so so at first i would like to introduce briefly myself and also my colleague with the green shirt will introduce himself so my name is chiara baldini I am part of the Liminal Village team since 2010. I'm a boomer since 2004, so I'm entering into this phase that I start to be a veteran of the scene. And actually, I have to say, it's quite cool, new experience. Um, and um, yeah, I guess usually I define myself as an independent researcher, which is another way to say I'm a self-made nerd. And also, which is a way to say, I think too much sometimes, <laughs> or I like to think and inquire and do research and figure stuff out. So, and in particular, I would like to share that I really have a big passion in knowing how the ancient Romans and ancient Greeks, so the first European civilizations, what did they do to get high? This, this has been one of my main passions that has been driving my uh, at least 10 years and I've been doing presentations and writing essays about it. You can find my work online if you're interested and I will refer to it if it happens during the course of the podcast. And then I have to say I really love music. I'm also a DJ sometimes. And um, I have to say, usually when I work in Boom, I am a backstage girl. I like to be behind the scene. And so today I am kind of expanding my horizon in being on the front line, on the online front line. So please bear with me as I go through this expansion of my box and of my possibilities. Thank you. And where is your uh, flesh and blood body at the moment? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so I'm, my body is originally from Florence, Italy. But uh, right now I'm in Portugal. And this is where I've been living for the past 10 years. Cool. Um, and so, hi, I'm the colleague. Um, I haven't been called a colleague since, I, since I've had an office job. Um, but, but we're being professional. I like it. Um, I am really awkward with introductions, um, but I'll guess I'll give you my name, which is also usually pronounced in two different ways by most people. It's either Ivan or Ivan. Split personality starts there. Uh, I'm gonna little, give you a little bit of stuff about my childhood. Um, I was the kind of kid who had a pet lizard. Um, I would study Lord of the Rings trivia competitively. I played one of the Lost Boys in a middle school production of Peter Pan. 
this has obviously led to some self-fulfilling prophecy components. Uh, my bicycle named Terence. Um, I named most of my objects after Terence McKenna, so I have a lot of Terences in my life. Um, my bike has often been my best friend. And, uh, and one of my longest term commitments uh, has been to, to raving um, dance floors. And I'm one of the few people who lived in Berlin and frequented dance floors who was not a DJ. Um, but I am very committed to sweating, moving my body, and getting into some altered states to try to learn things that way. I did stuff at university as well, but I ended up learning a lot more on dance floors. So yeah, happy to be here with everybody and uh, excited to bring in more faces. Can, can you explain why you have an American accent but you're not American? Glo globalization. Um, I, you know, it's funny because there's, 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 there's probably lots of reasons to it. Um, and one of the things I think has been because when I was growing up in the early 90s, uh, the American dream, even though it was like decaying, um, was still uh, like it was so cool to be American. And I think that that was one of the primary reasons why I was, you know, being the kid who had a pet lizard and studied Tolkien trivia competitively, um, was like, okay, how do I, you know, now that I'm going to speak this language, I'm also, yeah, my flesh and blood body right now is in Athens, Greece. Um, and I'm a genetic bastard. I'm a mutt of all kinds of uh, shapes and forms. But yes, the, the North American accent is, is something that stuck, um, an export from films, series, and watching Avatar uh, last airbender <laughs> all the time <laughs> growing up. So thank you for that. That gives us a good insight. I mean, we say this not to do self-promotion in any ways, just more to, um, to give a glimpse into who we are and where we speak from. So that's the purpose of doing this exercise of trying to explain who we are and what we like to do. And so what about we start now by introducing what the pod quests are about, what they are not yeah. about, what about that? So yeah, uh, also pod quest. Um, it, first of all, I've always not known what a podcast is. So I was like, what the heck, isn't this like, what happened to like just a radio or an audio recording? Where did podcasts come from? Um, so we decided to play with that and, and go with this concept of questing, um, questioning and going on a quest, on a mission to discover things. And that's what we're doing here. We have way more questions than answers. And, uh, and I also would like to think that the pod component um, could be a reference to an invasion of the body snatchers, a sci-fi uh, story from way back when where uh, these aliens would come and replace uh, human beings with exact replicas and they would be known as the pod people. So maybe on this quest, we can shed <laughs> some of our pods. Maybe, let's see. Um, and this 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 definition might change in future episodes. Um, let's 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 keep it um, emergent. But what we are also trying to do is be accessible. This is one of the things that Liminal Village, when it happens in in real life um, at Boom, tries to do uh, tries to democratize knowledge. Also, saying democratize knowledge is already not very democratic or inclusive because. That's also not necessarily an easy word, but make it accessible, make everything, all the stuff we say and all the concepts we grapple with and struggle with and play with uh, more easy to understand so that um, everybody has something to say and everybody, nobody feels left out um, and nobody feels inferior and less than, which is a really shitty feeling to feel. Um, and this is what people often do, especially in intellectual circles. They hold on to their intellect and all their big words um, to feel better about themselves because others don't have access to those words. Um, so we will try to check ourselves regularly, each other, and self-check to, to not, um, not be exclusive and elitist in how we speak um, and make it, make it nice and easy and accessible for everybody. And uh, yeah, and, and yeah, so we're going on a quest together for the next hour and a half or so. 
And so maybe it's time now to introduce uh, a third person here that she will appear, even if just briefly, directly from uh, a burlesque club <laughs> that she calls her bedroom in North Carolina. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome. Let's welcome. <laughs> Riley. <laughs> Hey everybody, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, I'm also on the Liminal Village team with Karen. And uh, uh, even though we can't be there with you guys now, we're excited to go along on this journey. And I'm here to support you all in engagement of this conversation. So we would love to hear from you, your questions, your comments, your memes in the chat boxes below. And we'll also be posting any relevant information that we discuss over the period. And at end of the talk, we'll have a Q&A. So uh, give us your questions. We are excited to hear from you. Thanks a lot, Riley. And about this, I would like to mention that um, we really appreciate if people share their comments, whatever they are, even if you don't agree what we just said, uh, we thrive on the possibility to to look at ourselves and to find out blind spots or things that we didn't uh, explain in, a, in the right way. But we really invite everyone to interact with respect and with maturity so that we can have conversations that can benefit everyone and can benefit the evolution of consciousness. So really, please uh, try even when maybe uh, strong emotions might come up, uh, please try to communicate in a respectful way and we will be delighted to hear anything you have to say. Thank like you. A YouTube, a YouTube comment classic is people like very quickly start calling each other Hitler or comparing each other to Hitler. <laughs> We discourage you from doing that. Um, if you really must, you know, so be it. But um, yeah, it's, 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 isn't it always really nice when you like stumble across a comment thread and people are actually having a nice conversation and they're like maybe critiquing each other, but like not calling each other names and not having it break down into complete like high school yard bullying. Um, and it's, and like, and then they wrap up with, having interacted and learned something from each other. So that's kind of the, the rules of engagement we'd like to see, but you know, it's always up to you. We're not gonna be all parenting. <laughs> so I think at this point so. we can actually start the part of the podcast that is specific about this episode. So this episode is called Capitalism and Other Viruses and we are going to explore systems of oppression. So many of us, I would like to start with a saying or an expression, it might even sound like a proverb, <laughs> something that we've all, we've all heard at least once in our lifetime, that is the best system is a sound system. So what does this say? This means that on one side, we really like good electronic music pumping from a good speaker, yes, but also it reveals the problematic nature of systems. And so why do we need to look at system, at our system? How, what is the system? How does, this, does the system work? And what can we learn from it? What can we, how can we recognize it? And also eventually also how can we change it? The thing is that what's happening now is that we are increasingly at a global level becoming aware that we are heading pretty fast towards what is called more and more commonly, even if horrifyingly, the sixth mass extinction. So this means that we have a last chance to really take a deep look at what are the dynamics that are creating this run into like a head first into the wall. So in discovering what are the deeper, deeper dynamics behind the running into towards the six mass extinction, we are taking a deep look into the scaffolding that is behind the system. What the what is the scaffolding about? What does it look like? And scaffolding structure, like the skeleton. The ske yeah, the skeleton behind this uh, set of rules that can be cultural, economical, political, 
what is behind all of this and also is it just one system or is it an intersection of many systems so um yeah tonight we're gonna look both at how this system works how does it create oppression on a large scale at the macro level but also how does this affect our interactions in a daily in a day-to-day -day, uh, life and how does it affect us at this micro level even al not allowing us to be able to have truthful transparent heartfelt connection with uh, with our siblings sometimes people we know sometimes people we don't know so without talking too much about this because also we want to hear from our guests I would say this is like a general thematic that we will look into. Do you have anything I, to add? I would just add that one of the things that also led I think, to, to this framing for us is that when COVID-19 hit and when we were in lockdown, a lot of people started spray painting on walls all around the world. Capitalism is the virus. And then patriarchy is the virus. And then sexism is the virus. And then racism is the virus. And so there was this competition of viruses that people were this, this, it's really great to see like street art because it's and it, even if it wasn't art even if it was just tagging it's this like collective expression of that's like spilling onto the city walls and people were you, you know th this was a this was a deeper systems commentary people were saying that it's, it's like look at look how these things spread they are viral they're an infection they're causing harm they're causing death they're having they're they're doing all the things that viruses are doing um and this is this is kind of and, and also they've in many ways given rise uh to the virus our the way we extract things the way we farm meat the way we do all these things um the way we oppress and assert power over animals and other sentient beings well, it's led to a lot of um, clusterfuck situations like the global pandemic we're dealing with. So that was the frame, that was the idea behind this framing. And we're all living in this system, in many of these systems. So it's cool to think about them. And that's what we're going to with you now. And so to talk about all of this, we summoned not just uh, uh, two incredible world-class agents conspiring for the evolution of consciousness, <laughs> but also <laughs> two very dear friends of ours that can help us to um, entertain a familiar vibe here in our first adventure with the podcast. And so without much further ado, I would like to introduce the first guest, he is a dancer, a performer, a shapeshifter, and a lawyer, which already is pretty cool, right? So I might even stop here and it's already like, wow. But I'm gonna go on. He has been using his knowledge of the rules of the system to support the work of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science, also known as MAPS, to help them to figure out ways to redesign the legal access of psychedelics and plant medicine, uh, both for therapeutic use, for scientific use, and even for personal use. And he has also been serving as the chair of the board of directors of the SSDP, the student, uh, the, so, uh, well, <laughs> I'm getting confused here. <laughs> I went too fast. Um, so the Students for Sensible Drug Policy. This is a nonprofit association that is doing amazing work worldwide. The association of students from everywhere that are pretty much working for the end to end the war on drugs, which is actually a war on people and is often um, reducing like pretty much oppressing the people that are in a vulnerable or marginalized position in society. So I would like to welcome Ismail Lorido Ali, also known as Izzy. <laughs> and I would like, hi Izzy. Hi there, we're good, am I live? Hello. Can you see me? I can see hi, you. Hi everyone. <laughs> 
And so I would like to jump uh, um, to make a connection through your work with the, the SSDP, because uh, when I knew about it the first time, at first I never heard about it until like two years ago when you told me about it. And I would like you to speak a little bit more about what is the SSDP about, what was so cool about working with them and serving their purpose. Because also, hopefully, we can inspire some students that are listening to us now into entering such a meaningful mission in life. If you guys hear the call for doing something similar, so please, easy, tell us a bit about how was it to work with them. Yeah, maybe I'll give a super quick additional piece of the introduction and then I can answer your question. Thank you so much um, for the invitation to join today. Thank you, Kiara and Ivan, for putting this together and for Riley and all of the team on the back end. Um, thank you so much, Elnor, for joining us. You'll, you know, we'll get, a, we'll get a chance to have a good conversation in a bit. Um, before saying anything else, I actually want to give a quick random acknowledgement of my own. I'm currently beaming in from my hometown of Fresno, California, which is about equal distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles, right in the dead middle of California, uh, where I grew up. It's um, Mono Land, also known as Paiute by some, um, where Native people have been here for many, many, many years before there was a city and before there were settlers here. Um, and I'm here just visiting in the midst of, you know, what's going on in the US with the pandemic and just spending some time here with my family. And I'm grateful to be beaming into y'all from here. Um, so to answer your question, um, Kiara, so just to be, just to clarify, I'm, I'm technically not the chair of the board of directors for SSDP anymore. I have cycled yeah. out, but I'm still in, involved with and supporting the organization. And I'm glad that you brought them up because um, what they what they do. So first off, SSDP was started about 20 years ago in response to the fact that students were not able to receive financial aid in the United States to go to college if they had uh, drug offenses on their record. And the idea of like the school to prison pipeline was kind of starting to get clarified and established at that point and has gotten continually clearer over time. So the move to support um, options for education and options for uh, access to um, other opportunities uh, and the idea that those should not be denied to people who had a history with drugs and specifically history interacting with the criminal legal system of the United States kind of took off and started this conversation. and. Today, SSDP is a global organization. As you said, it's all over Europe. You can check them out at schoolsnotprisons.org or SSDP.org. And it's a really, really good place for students Let and Let me say people, something, because you're, you're speaking very fast, and I just wanted mm, to say that- International audience. Yes, international audience, and guys at home, Riley's posting all of these links. So she's, you don't need to try to write it down, because <laughs> Riley is posting it on the chat. Thank you for clarifying that. And I'll also slow down just a bit. Um, but yeah, SSDP is an amazing organization. And for especially students and young people, you can check them out. They're doing work all over the world, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, in South America. There's chapters and groups all over. Um, I'll give a few other shout outs maybe while I'm here um, to the Sage Institute, which is an amazing nonprofit psychedelic therapy clinic in Oakland, California, that I recently joined the board of. And also shout out to the Chikuna Institute for the Protection of Sacred Plants and the Ayahuasca Defense Fund, which are both organizations that I also have gotten the honor of participating in and supporting and um, kind of participating in a number of different conversations around drugs, medicine, psychedelia, healing, and how we kind of integrate that into the big picture. Um, I'm a first generation hyphenated American, very mixed started marching against the war in Iraq and Afghanistan when I was 12 years old in 2002. I'll go a little bit more into that story later. Uh, but I've also been part of the underground kind of psychedelic and rave culture for 15 years. I've also been raving in my bedroom and may or may not be a pod person. I think the jury's out on that one. Um, thanks for the invitation. I'll say lots more later. There also, I want to say that you've been to Boom two times. Once you were volunteering mm -hmm. Cosmic Care, and once you were just partying and contributing to the Liminal <laughs> Village program. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. For, I'm so glad to be here digitally. And potentially for people who don't know Cosmic Care, Kara, want to let us very quickly know what Cosmic Care is? Cosmic Care is uh, the area in Boom where we do harm reduction. So it's a place where you can go if you are having a psychedelic emergency, if you're not feeling well, if you need support, if you need care. That's where you find it at a very high level as 
we can see from the kind of people that collaborate to the project. All right, and uh, I'm gonna not waste any time to introduce our next speaker and guest, uh, who's very dear to me. And I think the most important thing I can say very personally is that when uh, he and I met, um, a lot of things started changing in my life quite radically um, in terms of what I was doing, in terms of what I was thinking about. So he's really been instrumental in shaping where I'm at today. Um, and I'm telling him this for the first time now, um, <laughs> but he knows. Uh, so I would, he's, he's com he comes from a Sufi lineage and lineage is something that we are also trying to look at and acknowledge and think about because it's, it's usually not something that's uh, high on the priority list of capitalism, one of our favorite viruses. And uh, he's a mystical anarchist, which I'm gonna leave it into mystery as to what that means, but there's a little bit of anarchy and mysticism and Shiva energy for the hippies. <laughs> and, uh, and he's smart, he's got lots of degrees um, to prove the education, but um, it's, it's again, all the, all the journeying that he's done in traveling and thinking and experiencing all kinds of um, states and putting his body and mind through crazy journeys and rites of passage that I think have given him um, some pretty cool insights um, that I love listening to. So I would like to invite uh, with the magic of whoever's doing the magic uh, behind the scenes, Riley, uh, Al Noor Lada. Are we live? Okay, we're live. We're probably live. We're gonna trust that we're live. Uh, <laughs> and my first, my, so so he's currently in a really cool intentional community uh, that they're putting together in Costa Rica, in uh, Tierra Valiente. And my initial question would be, why are you there? Uh, yeah, I, I thank you for for having me and um, putting this together, Kiara and Ivan and the whole Liminal team. Uh, and uh, beautiful to be with Izzy as well. And so, yeah, I, fr I think I have to first uh, either acknowledge or apologize for the allegations and uh, uh, also say, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, the idea of introductions and the idea of, you know, me having any influence on your life is, uh, is of course, we, we chalk it up to entanglement, right? And uh, uh, the, the sort of interweaving of being between us and, and our ancestral relationship uh, beyond this dimension. And yeah, I think that goes for all of us on this, uh, yeah, quantum container online here and, and not just the, the four of us, uh, but, but everyone who's really on this call. Um, and so, yeah, I say shukran uh, to the universe, so, which is the, the Arabic word for gratitude, uh, to, to all the cosmic forces, the, the conspiracy of things that, that bring us together. Um, and, the, and the question was, uh, wh where am I and, and why am I here, essentially, right? Um, well, I, yeah, I didn't know where you were, but just why. Why, okay, yeah. Um, we can answer that in, in, in many ways, right? There's the, the existential answer, which, which I would uh, initially lean to, but maybe to say um, um, the, the political uh, answer to that, which is, um, I, I feel many of us are waking up to the idea that our dominant culture is insane and we have to find ways outside of it. And um, we're part of this growing choir of people, this growing movement of people who are, who are conscientious objectors to, to capitalism and to the dominant uh, extractive industrial life destroying system that we find ourselves in uh, without our consent. You know, we're, we're born into the system. And so that was kind of, I guess, the main impetus in many ways for, for the experiment of, of Tierra Valiente. And we're trying to build this post-capitalist community uh, to, to not be in the ownership of land, to be in the stewardship of land, to live in the gift as opposed to commodification and transaction and exchange, um, and to, to live in symbiosis with the living planet and really asking what does she want? What does this piece of geography that we are embedded with and wedded to, what, what does she want? Uh, what does she want to grow? How does she want to evolve us and grow us? And so that's the, the, the experiment we're in right now. And there's about um, 
30 or so of us involved in the project and about 15 of us living on the land right now. In, in, we're in like Northwest Costa Rica, about uh, two, three hours south of the Nicaragua border in, in the rainforest in the jungle here. So basically, he's describing most hippies' wet dream, and uh, <laughs> and, and and living it, uh, and yeah, I, and you know, just I love cities as well. But as soon as I spend a little bit of time in them, I immediately start feeling the suffocation and the system kind of like a meat grinder. And you know, then then I like look to a plant and like like stage one here just so that you can see some green um because all of you potentially might not have access to green as well all of you who are stuck in cities and and you know that also does all kinds of stuff to our physiology um all that stuff that we've cleaned out of our lives to make it nice and sanitary and clean um and messed up so yeah um i'm very jealous of the life decisions you've taken <laughs> to be where you are now um, but drawing inspiration from it and um I want us to get to the point where we can all mix and say stuff. Um, we had planned to also add this thing called, we were naming it the Inclusometer. Um, we were thinking of like a format of a, like psychedelic 60s television, daytime television talk show, uh, where it's like, all right, Karen, put on the Inclusometer. And then there's like a machine that beeps how inclusive we're being um, in various ways. Uh, and. And so, you know, I, I would like to acknowledge that there is always some sort of lack of diversity, um, diversity of lived experience. Uh, we're trying to really represent as many kinds of voices and people and thoughts and patterns and types of knowledge throughout um, the program. And there's going to be many more episodes to come. So even though you can see a, a bias towards the male identifying creatures um, today, uh, there is there is quite a bit of diversity in terms of uh, social status, in terms of upbringing and econ economics, uh, in terms of um, sexual orientation, um, in terms of ethnic uh, diversity, and uh, what am I missing out? And, and, and also just viewpoints. Um, everybody's taken different kinds of uh, journeys to, to get where they are. So so we don't we don't know how the inclusometer is going to work. Um, maybe people can just like swear at us in the comments um, in, if, if if they feel that we are being appalling. Um, but we will try to integrate feedback. Uh, also, outrage culture is something that we can also get into at some point. Um, but yeah, uh, ground rules of, of what we met. Go go ahead. I just wanted to say that this is to say that we are aware of the topic of inclusivity. We are not obsessive, uh, obsessing about having all the voices present in each episode, but along all the series, we will have uh, a big diversity of voices. And so inclusivity in this case is a journey and uh, is a place to get, but to really be in the journey to get there more than in the place. And so this is also where, like, you know, the participatory element is comments and questions. And we're going to try and bring in all, as many of those voices as well in the last segment. So we're going to have a conversation bit now. We're all going to chat together. And uh, and then there's going to be a part where we're going to do some questions and take questions from whoever's watching. So that's going to be a point also where we can include more voices. The framing phrase for for the talk today is something that's attributed to a couple of people, including Slavoj Žižek, which was, it's easier to imagine an end to the world than an end to capitalism. Um, and there's a couple of other isms uh, that we're going to get into, but I want to kick us off with Al-Noor, um, and he can share something personal, um, personal story of his experience with capitalism. And a way that it was harmful, traumatic, and the way that it was potentially beneficial and uplifting. Um, over to you. Mm, yeah, well, you know, I think maybe even before we, we, we get into the personal story, um, maybe to say just a bit about the, the, like what capitalism is, right? Because I think that creates like a, um, a unifying frame between all of us. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so, the simplest place maybe to start is to say that look, uh, 
ideology is always a background condition. It exists. It's the, the invisible architecture that's all around us, right? There's no aspect of our life that is not mediated by capital. Where we work, uh, how we got that work, our educations, what we're eating, where we're living, every single aspect of our life is mediated by capital. And well, how did that happen, right? We, well, we used to have many ways to acquire goods and services, uh, and it was largely through relationships. And you know, we could fish and barter and hunt and gift and um, and and trade and you know all of those sort of more yeah relational ways of of acquiring goods and services. And now we have one way to do that, which is debt-based capital, largely US debt-based capital. And there's an implication to that, right? There's an implication at a, at a sort of global level. And the way debt-based capital works is really simple, actually. Your uh, debt, your, your growth has to exceed your interest rate in order for that money to be valuable, in order for the pie to grow enough to pay back the debt, which is what money is at its conception. And that's just a made up rule that we made up, right? It's, it's man-made, right? And uh, just like compound interest is, is man-made, it's just a, a fiction. But what it does is if you have debt, you have infinite debt. And if you have capital, you have infinite capital. And so that pie grows in a certain way. And so economists and so-called experts at, at the World Bank and other places will say, we have to grow the global economy at 3% per year to not be in depression, stagflation, whatever. And what that means for all of us is that we have to double the global economy every 20 years. So 3% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's compound. And so every 20 years, that means we're consuming twice as many Big Macs and McFlurries and Toyota Priuses and what have you. Uh, it means doubling the amount of human labor that's extracted, killing double the amount of animals, raising double the amount of the rainforest. It, and so that, that is really the, the kind of uh, the, the backdrop to all of our lives. And the, the kind of, let's say, philosophy uh, underrooting that is some people will call it neoliberalism, which is, you know, maybe uh, uh, sort of too complex of a word. But I, I think it's actually an important word to say um, and to actually mention because it is the, the current brand of capitalism. You know, it's the sort of uh, historical accumulation of all the psychosis of our past melded into, into one system. And, and, and the system is, is basically, I think the simplest way to, to see and think about neoliberalism or late stage capitalism or, you know, market fundamentalism or whatever you want to call it is to think of it as a, a complex adaptive evolutionary system. It's alive. And it's like Frankenstein, you know, it's the greatest Frankenstein we've ever created. Um, all these Silicon Valley people are waiting for the singularity, you know, when technology overtakes human beings, but we're in the singularity, right? This system we've created has overtaken all of our free wills. There's no uh, idea of freedom or agency outside of this religion, this dogma that is capitalism. And it's kind of three philosophical principles, let's just say, are, um, our relationships are defined through competition, right? I'm better, richer, so hierarchy is embedded in it, right? And with that hierarchy, uh, it, what it rewards is a sort of uh, a type of brute strength that lends itself, like the people who do better in this system are essentially people who are better at uh, extraction, greed, war, violence, short-termism, you know, other life-denying tendencies. And so wealth is equated with success therefore virtue so therefore like rich people are good and poor people are bad right that's the kind of whether this is explicitly acknowledged or not this is kind of what we're living within uh and then the the last kind of core of the it's 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 religion is that the individual is the primary unit of power right so people are responsible for themselves first maybe their family second and possibly god in that order <laughs> you know it's the kind of uh th th that's its kind of worldview right and it leads to all sorts of crazy ideas like trickle-down economics and the invisible hand and we won't get into any of that right now but to say that's that's the background of what we're we're dealing with and so then how does it affect me directly well it, it's it's almost like the how how does water affect a fish 
right? And the quality of that water. It's essentially everything. It's like it, it affects the manner by which I approach essentially anything. And 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 this is not a, a statement of, of uh, sort of malaise or victimhood or sadness because it's part of understanding the culture in which we live allows us to navigate how we get around that culture, right? And so for, for me, uh, I grew up poor in, in East Vancouver. I have, um, my parents were immigrants from East Africa and I was sort of enmeshed in the system where I was told, you know, like most immigrant parents who have Stockholm syndrome, uh, you know, they, they sort of uh, end up falling in love with their oppressor's ways. Uh, you know, they wanted me to be a lawyer or, or, or what have you. And, and so it affected me directly in the sense that what my sort of, uh, let's say, parameters, my guardrails for what I could even think about were predetermined by being born in, in Vancouver in the 70s, right? That sort of culture was set for me in that way. And to be seen as successful or useful in that culture would have meant I did certain things. And, um, you know, of course, I did do those things for certain periods of time, right? And I'm still unlearning, you know, what I was uh, sort of forced to, to learn and assimilate to in, in uh, high school and university and, and other neoliberal organs and institutions. And so it's really defined my life because as soon as you understand how the oxygen works and you're like, you know, I don't actually subscribe to these values. It gave me the opportunity to, to actually evolve into, into myself. And it actually gave me um, the opportunity to be broken, <laughs> you know, to, to be in uh, despair, to be in ennui, to, to then go and humble myself to the plants and psychedelics and, uh, you know, the vanguard and uh, avant-garde art and, you know, other forms of, of uh, uh, disobedience from mainstream culture. And in that sense, I would say um, it's, it's this all-encompassing virus and non-dualistically, it's also uh, the gift of modernity. In a nutshell. <laughs> Um, all right, so I, I, was, I was immediately thinking when you talk about the unit of uh, capitalism uh, being the individual and, and a good old uh, mouthpiece for capitalism, old Maggie Thatcher, saying there's no such thing as society. Um, and, and also the fact that it's often seen as brainwashing, conditioning, and then there has to be this point, there's some point where you are acknowledging that there's that you're not vibing with whatever context you're whatever system you're growing up in that's this moment of disobedience um, and oftentimes when we're growing up there's these moments of disobedience where we break the rules and we kind of play with the rules and we want to see and i mean you also had an organization called the rules playing with this uh very specifically and pushing you know and whose rules um whose rules are we inheriting and so I would love to go back into the question of disobedience, but before, um, and one more thing, I never thought I would be defending lawyers, but you can be a different cool kind of lawyer because Izzy was studied law. And my friend Paul is also a badass lawyer. Um, so never thought I'd be defending lawyers, but yeah, I've come around. No, um, totally. There's lots of ways in and there's lots of ways out. Yeah, ooh, <laughs> and, and now, and that's for our after party talk, <laughs> uh, that, quote, that quote right there. Um, so, I'm gonna just, yeah, pass the baton to Izzy and move to another virus, because um, there's lots, and we promised you lots of viruses with framework capitalism, but then a recently uh, focused on uh, virus racism. Um, and since California is one of the hotspots, um, at least in international media today, um, discussing this, I wanted Izzy to have some reflections on and personal yeah. stories about, about this one. Yeah, thank you so much for the context. With very loud background noise. Give me like five seconds. <laughs> this is. I mean, this is also live, the there, are of, there are a lot of raised trucks in the Central Valley of California. A lot loud raised trucks in the background. Um, thank you so much, Elnor, for that breakdown um, and for kind of putting that framing in. Um, it, a lot of experiences, you know, as we've had a few conversations before, and a lot of experiences that you describe um, really resonate with me, and I'll speak a bit to that when I talk about my personal experience, but maybe zooming out a bit um, to the point that Ivana is making around how these things intersect. You know, it's hard. One of the challenges, I think, of this conversation is 
trying to separate. And I understand that what we're doing is we're kind of, you know, breaking the engine apart so we can see all the pieces before we put it back together to really analyze what's going on. Um, but I recognize that, you know, if I, I'll share a bit about what I, my understanding of how we think about racism and how we think about um, ethnic and cultural separation while acknowledging that it is not separate necessarily from the systems of capitalism that El Noor just described. Um, so we're really talking about compounding factors, not uh, independent ones. And the idea that they're independent or not related to one another is part of that atomization, which or individualizing that kind of reducing the size of the um, the unit that we're talking about. So the idea that racism and capitalism, for example, are not linked is propaganda. And it's really important to remember that there is and has been a direct link between um, what we're talking about, which is broader than just the word capitalism, right? But to El Noor's point, there are many mechanisms um, that all kind of come together to create a system of haves and have nots and perpetuate that in perpetuity, or at least that's the idea. So regarding the question about um, what's happening, I'll just start by saying that yes, I am in the United States, I'm in California, where we are almost 40 days into, in some places, nonstop protesting and demonstrating in the US, although some of the American media has um, started to cover other things more. The reality is that there are still people here in the US every day um, standing in support of black lives, for the movement for black lives, for George Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, for Tony McDade, for Elijah McClain, for a number of people who are unjustly and um, extrajudicially murdered by law enforcement um, over the course of the last months, but they are really What do you mean? Easy, sorry, because you are a lawyer, mm -hmm. you can explain good uh, in a good way. What does what do you mean extrajudicially? Mm, thank you for clarifying and the good reminder for the incluso meter. Extrajudicially essentially means that it is happening outside of a legal context. And I'm glad that you brought it up because there are people here who would argue that the deaths occurred in the legal context, that they were murdered or killed in contexts that were technically legal, the systems that um, allow uh, law enforcement and uh, the justice system or the criminal legal system to operate as it does, um, has certain mechanisms. And the mechanisms themselves are problematic and have a number of limitations. Um, but what I was referring to here is that even with those unjust mechanisms, there are further injustices that are uh, perpetuated even outside of those systems, but supported by those systems. So. What I'm talking about now is the, um, in addition to the violence that's already being uh, perpetuated by the criminal legal system, there are the recent waves of uh, protests and demonstrations in the United States have to do with that unjust system being pushed even further or um, having outcomes that seem beyond the pale, even for our desensitized American understanding of the violence of the system as it operates. So we're, yeah, like I said, 40 days into this particular round of protests, but really this particular um, wave of the movement, Black Lives Matter, started so five or six years ago and has been building over time and kind of um, crystallizing now um, into calls to reduce funding for or eliminate policing or uh, shift policing practices in the way that we have done them so far in the United States, which have been historically race and protection, based in protection of private property and maintaining racial covenants, essentially, um, which basically means maintaining the uh, racial caste system, which has been, on, from a legal perspective, reduced over time from slavery to Jim Crow to the post-civil rights era. But in actuality, we see uh, remnants of those systems woven into the continuation of policing and incarceration in the United States and around the world. So people are fed up, people are fed up and people have been fed up. And I think that the pause uh, that's been happening via, because of COVID, which we'll get more into later in this talk has given American society, especially um, people who have not maybe historically been as visibly in support of political movements in support of black lives to wake up a bit, 
you know, I don't want to be too optimistic, but at least recognize that business as usual can't continue and that something has to be done. So I'll use, utilize that maybe as a segue into a little bit of my own experience. Um, I'm, I'm what people call a mixed race. Um, I don't have the experience of, of a black American or a native American person. Um, I have the experience of a kind of ambiguously brown person with a Muslim name. Um, and I, that, you know, I, I kind of really developed my identity in the post 9-11 era where in the United States, there was a shift, a racialization of Muslims, especially uh, up until like the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, although some Islamophobia certainly existed, the um, and, you know, we had the U.S. started um, occupying and going to war with countries in the Middle East and in Asia years before that, obviously. Um, but by 9-11, there was this sense that it was possible for kind of Arab descendant people or Muslim people to kind of get away with assimilating. And to Al Noor's point earlier, you know, a lot of people, my parents, the first generation people came in and they were able to assimilate. They were able to participate in society um, and experience the benefits of that partially because of the opportunities that they, that they gained from leaving their home countries. Um, but when 9-11 happened, the idea of moving into this prosperous nation that would have all of, the, um, all of the opportunities that one could imagine started to dissolve. And the realization that the US empire uh, was blood hungry and power hungry and that that was not gonna change anytime soon became very clear after 9-11 uh, with the invasion and the occupation of Afghanistan, which is still happening, and Iraq, which is also still happening, um, nearly 20 years later. So I experienced a lot of angst as a young teenager, um, trying to reconcile my parents, you know, their association, their desire to come to the United States, the fact that we were in this place that had offered so much opportunity to them and later to myself and my brothers, while also recognizing that it had uh, a very visible and obvious shallow side, or a shadow side, excuse me. So I think that the that angst kind of propelled me into a political socialization, a political awareness um, in the post 9-11 era that kind of like Elnor was saying, started to kind of pull pieces out of the puzzle that had seemed kind of um, misplaced in the first place. And I think over the course of the last 20 years after discovering psychedelics and underground culture and really starting to figure out how to push back from an individual and identity perspective to some of these labels that had been placed on me and the people around me, um, I began to develop some of that angst and some of that rejection of the system while also holding that this, I didn't call it that then, but holding this non-dual reality that although there were all of these harms, all of these impacts of the system that I was participating in, that I still was born into a place with a certain kind of opportunity and took those opportunities, which is why I ended up going to law school and deciding to become a lawyer, while also holding that the legal system in the United States is uh, highly unethical, corrupt, and born out of a number of systems that have caused tremendous harm, suffering, and violence to people over the course of the world and here for a very long time. So trying to hold both the angst kind of of the um, of the illusion being shattered while also holding and we'll talk more about this over the course of this uh, conversation the optimism and the imagination that can come from the what happens when you break through the critique into the possibility of uh, what happens next so I'll just end maybe by saying this balance around how I have been harmed and how I've been benefited you know um, I experienced a lot of discrimination, received death threats. I was very involved with my mosque when I was a teenager doing interfaith work and specifically trying to build uh, relationships between faith communities and a lot of people in the Central Valley. I, you know, there was definitely some resistance. We had undercover agents at our mosque and um, lots of kind of interpersonal um, issues come out of that. But I also, like I said, was able to utilize the platform that emerged around me to also put myself in a position of relative privilege through getting educated. And now I'm trying to hold that and figure out how to integrate it into whatever we do next. So I'll stop there and we can go more into it later. Thank you. 
Whew. Uh, we're good. Okay. I feel like we, I need a, a fan both because it's super hot in here and because some of these uh, topics are taking me back to being ground under by the systems that I was seeing and not really having any like really close friends to talk to about this. And I'm wondering about all the young people now, the teenagers who like, who are their idols? Who are their, who are they idolizing? Who are their role models? And that is all often really an important part of which, which path you end up following and finding more about. But so let's go into the path, the early path of a young Italian girl um, dealing with the stronghold of patriarchy. Ms. Ballini. I'm having trouble hearing you, and I don't know if that's me. Or... Now is my microphone on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so as you say, Italy is pretty much the stronghold, the headquarters of one particular aspect of uh, the um, of this uh, big monster to which we all contribute in a way or another that is uh, the, the system of oppression. And well, because I'm referring mainly to patriarchy and the specific aspect of patriarchy that I came in touch with, which is the, the Christian church as an institution. So, and actually when I say this, I also want to say that even if usually we refer to patriarchy as connected to the Christian church, but if we look at patriarchy as a social system that is built on a hierarchy that places male on top of female and place the female in a subordinate, subordinate position, then we can also see that this is the only thing that all the monotheistic religions agree on, because this same hierarchy is in place with all in all the other main monotheistic religions. So as I was growing up and becoming aware of this, I was even laughing about it. Okay, so the guys have been fighting for centuries over so many different rules, uh, so many different points of disagreement, so a lot of these uh, religion wars, but there was one thing that they all agreed on, that uh, is the female has, is in this subordinate position, she's supposed to obey to the men, she's supposed to obey to the rules that were written by the men. Um, so, um, yeah, and so... So, yeah, I think the main point here that I want to make very briefly is just this point about the hierarchies, because this is a recurring point in all of these systems, aspects of the systems we are referring to, because there is like a polarity and usually nature works like this, plus, minus, day, night, light, shadow, female, male, and the polarity is just there for life to happen, but the system creates a hierarchy of the two polarities. And so I think this is one of the takeouts that we can take when we look at how do we identify the system of oppression. When you see that there is a category, it can be connected to race, it can be connected to gender, to sexual orientation. When you see that the, a specific category is placed in a subordinate position in relation to another category, that's where you see, okay, there's something here that is creating discrimination and oppression. Because actually how nature works is that there is uh, an organism that is made of many different aspects and there's not really one that is more important than the other. And we can see from, for example, for, from the fact that if the bees disappears, the bees, something so small, if they disappear, we are not able to eat because the flowers don't get pollinated, they don't create fruits, they don't create vegetables and all of that. So in this sense, nature works in a way that even the smallest, even the tiniest part of it has a place that is important. And when this order is misinterpreted in a way to create this hierarchy where one is more important than the other, then we are not functioning according to the original rules, the original instructions that are very different than the rules of the system. 
So I would like to share a story that it really comes from when I was really a child, maybe 10 years old. That was my first encounter with this patriarchal system through the Christian church because growing up in a rural small town in the rural Italy in Tuscany all the kids were supposed to go to Christian school this was normal it was not because my parents were particularly religious it was just what kids did and uh, I think it was like once a week we would go a couple of hours to this Christian school it's called catechismo so one day we were studying the Ten Commandments. And you know, like, don't kill, don't lie, respect your parents. I can relate to all of that, that's fine. So when we get to commandment number nine, the teacher says, you shall not desire another man's woman. And the first thing I think about is like, ah, this is just for the boys. And I go like, is this just for the boys? I ask the teacher. Does it mean that um, the boys have to obey to 10 commandments and the girls just to nine? Can I just not take care of that? And the teacher, she starts laughing. And I really remember this moment because she says, well, actually, we talk about men to refer to the whole of humanity. And I was like, wait a minute, how does that work? That's even more weird. Because I'm not a man, but I am humanity. So how do I fit in a place that is not made for me to fit in there in a way? And, you know, I, I still remember this point because I really think that children are much more aware of when discrimination happens than we give them credit, we give them credit for. Because I felt like, okay, there's something about me that is different. And so this was just the very beginning because then later, the, next, the following years, I also figured out that women couldn't be priests. And even this, I was like, why? Why not? And then all the reasons that they would give, Jesus only ordered his disciples, they were all male, and so the, priest, uh, the priesthood goes according to that rule. And I was like, this sounds fabricated. And then when I also became a teenager and realized all the restrictions about sexuality, also that was like, okay, there is something, and I want to make this clear. One thing is the teachings of Jesus, and mainly they are about being a good person, being kind, being gen generous, acting with compassion. And all of that I was really resonating with. I was a good girl. I wanted to be a good girl to follow those teachings. And even the teachings connected to um, love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemy. These kind of teachings still today, they have such a revolutionary power if they were applied, that make Jesus not just the first hippie <laughs> that is, was preaching peace and love, but really a revolutionary that still nowadays we are not putting in practice this. And we see how many religious communities, different kinds of uh, um, Christian groups are not living according to these principles. So I just want to honor the people that are still in Christianity because of Jesus. And I think it's really a lot of, uh, um, a, like, it's still a big process to be able to embody those teachings, so simple and so hard at the same time. And so I realized with time that one thing were the teachings of Jesus and one thing was the Catholic Church as an institution. And I realized that the way that they, a bunch of men and men only, interpreted the Holy Scriptures and the messages was just their way. It was not my way. And so I, I started making a distinction there. And... Um, yeah, it, um, I moved out. But did you have any benefit to living under patriarchy? Was there a silver lining? Let me. No, I was. I just wanted to be sure I said everything I wanted to say. 
Yeah, because I still wanted to say that I was privileged in the sense that this was a soft impact with patriarchy compared to the impact that other women and girls have to go through. You know, if you're born as a girl in a place where they do female genital mutilation, it's really hardcore. And if you're born in a place where girls don't have access to instruction, this is a very different life experience than the one I had. And so in a way, even if, I was in a patriarchal society, but being European and living in this time helped me to be able to actually live a life that is much more free than many women right now. And I, my heart always goes to them. And this has been one of the guiding inspiration in my life also to empower other women and to help other women in their path to, towards freedom. So... Yeah, and we can see still now, even in these uh, uh, modern times and even in the privileged uh, white world, we can see how much, for example, with the Me Too movement, there's so much to work on. And there's so many rules to change and there's so many stories to change. And so, yeah, even now that so many people say, yeah, but patriarchy is long gone. This is not, you know, for us white Westerners is not a problem anymore. It is. And I'm happy that the Me Too movement brought it up again with so much strength. And I really hope that this can bring an evolution of consciousness in a lot of people. So about the benefits, I really had to think about it. Like, how did I did I get benefits from it? And the only point that I could come up with was to really become honest about the fact that being a cute girl, when I grew up, I realized that this beauty and even being blonde in a Southern country, this was like a double-edged sword. So on one side, I got a lot of unwanted attention, unsolicited conversations, all kinds of uh, psychological and physical harassments of different kinds and different intensity. And all the girls and women that I know have gone through this process of being harassed in different levels and ways, but all of them. So groping and uh, just being scared if I walk by myself in the night in a city and uh, a lot of that kind of stuff. But then on the other side, I realized that this meant, like all of this attention meant that I have something that they want. I have something that they like. So some of them are really crazy for it. So I realized, huh, so this is a power. And how can I use this power? And in my 20s especially, I kind of flipped the story and started using my power of my beauty and my whatever seduction <laughs> power to sometimes twist the situation and get what I wanted. Example, when I took my driving license and I knew that I could be stopped by the police, this is also a reference to another kind of police interactions that Izzy was mentioning. So when I was young, I knew that if the police stopped me, usually were young carabinieri, I could smile at them in a way that they would just let me go. And this was like, okay, this works. This gives me like something that I can play with. But then also I realized with time that this was a way of manipulating the guys. And so in my thirties, I managed to become aware of that and really also shift out of that, hopefully. But so my question is actually, can you benefit from a system of oppression without oppressing? without enacting some sort of manipulation. Because I don't think that we can benefit without oppressing from a system of oppression. Ooh, all right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that all of these behaviors are learned. Um, so if we go back to whether, you know, whether, whether you're suddenly finding success and valuing success as somebody who has accrued a lot of money and that becomes your goal as a kid or whether you're picking on somebody because of the color of their skin and making them feel less than and suddenly you have some cool points 
and exerted dominance over another, or whether you have excluded women out of the picture and then again felt somehow um, validated. This is all learned. I don't. I don't think any kid comes with that programmed um, into their into their genes. Like our closing off virus, uh, which is the least accessible in terms of term, which we were calling heteronormativity, um, basically hetero good, homo bad. Um, and I'm gonna be very brief because we don't have a lot of time. We're all very chatty people and, uh, and I want us to have space for, for space for questions. So all I'm gonna say is following the thread of church, um, which ironically enough is a, there's lots of very fabulous homo erotica in the Vatican and a lot of churches um, just super suppressed and we see how that ends up. Um, I, my story is that I, I knew that I was queer since I was about 13, I guess. And that was something that was an aspect of myself that I had to hide. Um, I had to learn, and that was a learned behavior as well. Learn how to hide a part of yourself because it's not accepted. You're gonna get bullied, you're gonna get picked on. I was already getting bullied because I couldn't play team sports with big balls, other balls I wanted to play with. <laughs> um, and, and so I was like, okay, well, since you're already being called a faggot and a pussy for not being able to play football, um, you know, it's 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 not gonna get a hell, a hell of a lot better if you hold Mark's hand uh, in public. So, and of course, this is also something that started in the home and I was already being called a pussy by my father when I was doing all kinds of things that he would consider effeminate or uh, not manly. So manly good, womanly bad, uh, according to whoever's uh, messed up perspective. And and that's where a lot of, a lot of infection, mental infection can happen uh, when you bottle up something in a part of yourself that you're not allowed to express. Um, in, in fact, I think most people would have a much more fluid sexual orientation if they were just free to explore it openly when they're growing up, uh, as opposed to there's a right one and there's a wrong one. And this binary thinking of, of um, again, good or bad in, in these parts of messy, chaotic, fluid aspects of our lives, uh, that's what causes hurt and trauma. And ironically enough, uh, it seems as though otherness and difference is something that these systems, these viruses fear. Uh, ironically enough, communism uh, usually gets the label of trying to homogenize people, have people uh, be all the same in some way, take away from this individuality. Whereas um, there's a very specific model of what's acceptable and permissible under capitalism, what's okay, what gets a checklist. It's just a different kind of uh, checklist. So, so yeah, uh, were, were there silver linings to it? There are strange silver linings. Uh, you are able to access community because you become a minority and you feel like you've been like, like uh, namaste, my trauma recognizes your trauma. Let's be friends. Um, so that you know ended up being a shortcut to, to finding community with, with people who were traumatized in the same way. And this doesn't just, uh, I don't just mean the queer community. I also mean, I mean, some of my closest friends are just very sensitive straight guys um, who were mind fucked by the same kind of heterorism uh, that, that I was. And so there is already a, a shortcut there to, to meeting people and connecting with them and feeling like they're your tribe. And that was definitely cool. And, uh, and of course, if you end up working in the arts, uh, it's it's easier. Uh, it, it's it's a total double standard, but it's uh, it helps. Uh, you get and sometimes this also helps now in in activist circles. Like if you meet if if you are a like rich straight white guy and a little bit older, my God, you're not going to be able to get much like word in edgewise, which is understandable on the one hand, but on the other hand, I'm not un entirely sure that we can wear. Uh, and I'm, I'm enjoying Izzy's movement because I would love a reaction. And this is where we can go in, like, because I'm wrapping up this component so we can start in, in the back and forth. Um, 
I also think it's sometimes an issue in politics when people wear an aspect of themselves as a right or a badge to create policy or to be better than somebody else. I feel like that's a replication of some of the same patterns that are problematic. But I, I enjoyed the shoulder movement and I would I will immediately give the word over to you. Um, well, thanks for the, the background and context. And I guess the, the response you saw was that um, what you said that, you know, rich, white, straight males can't get a word in edgewise sounds to me a little bit like what we're calling cancel culture. And I'm just drawing attention to the letter that was just written. I think it was in um, mm -hmm. uh, some large magazine, the name I can't remember right now. Uh, it, ca about, it came out in The Guardian. It, uh, oh, it was also there? Okay, yeah. So it was this, this letter that kind of pointed to the fact that like outrage culture or cancel culture is limiting the power of free speech. I thought it was kind of ironic that the people who actually signed on to that letter are all people who have uh, extremely uh, visible platforms on extremely large newspapers um, that uh, in fact are- Easy, because mm -hmm. I'm not sure I know what is cancel culture. Can you explain? Nobody knows what it is. There's a lot of different perspectives on what it means. Um, but what I can share is, I guess, to bring in the idea that Ivan mentioned is that there's this perception that because the media um, ecosystem is becoming more horizontal because social media has made it so not only people who have access to newspapers or other large publications have voices, there's this backlash coming from people who have historically had a lot of voice, including people like the ones that Yvonne was talking about. Um, and this belief that the uh, public critique and consequences of what one says are the same thing as being canceled or removed from society. So this idea of cancel culture or outrage culture kind of, I believe is a response, is a reaction, but it's a facade. It's the perception of persecution. Like it's, it put, it allows people with power and platforms to be perceived as victims because they can't get a word in edwa edgewise in this new world. When what's actually happening is that they're actually just experiencing consequences um, of saying things publicly and people who disagree with them are getting platforms that they haven't had before. So I hear what you're saying, Yvonne, and I do think that there is some variation and certainly double standards in some of the activist world. Um, and I'd be curious about Al Noor's thoughts on this, but I don't think it's the case that uh, rich people or white people or men don't dominate the world of activism because I think that in many cases that is still the case around the world. Um, and what's happening is that there is a bit of a shift in who has access to the mic because of Twitter and Instagram and the internet. Um, and, you know, changes in who's being platformed. I think that Boom Festival in Liminal Village is actually a good example of a place, you know, in 2018, y'all brought people who are Native Americans, y'all brought people who were, who are of a number of different marginalized identities, refugees and other people to the stage, which is not something that a lot of American festivals or gatherings are doing. So there's kind of a shift in the platforms that are becoming accessed by people. And I think that's a big part of how people are interpreting the power dynamic shifts. But let's be clear, that stuff that Al Noor was talking about, those like background operating systems um, do not disappear simply because some of the mechanisms start to look a little bit different. Like we're still in swimming, we're still swimming in that water. We're still addicted to punishment as Deborah Peterson Small says, we're still addicted to, um, this hierarchy and to the kind of still being driven by this particular, and when I say we, I want to be really specific here because to El Noor's point earlier, we are certainly subject to the culture that we're living in, um, in a way that's non-consensual. Um, and to your point, Chiara, we are, I think, I don't know if it's possible to benefit without perpetuating oppression, which puts a lot of people who are currently benefiting simply by existing, um, in a position where they have to actively dismantle and actively be traitors to the systems of privilege that they're given. And that's the part that's a little bit harder, I think, for people to actually, um, I like the term that the, the, it's, it's divesting, but it's conscientious objecting, right? Like to, to Al Noor's point, it's more than just saying, we're not going to go to the war that you're sending us to. It's that we were born into a war and that we are going to step out of it to the extent that we can. Maybe it's a lifelong goal, maybe it's a, a, a slow process over time. But I think the energy of divesting our own energy and our own resources and 
uh, affect from those systems is is um, is something that anyone with privilege can start to learn how to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I, 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 I just say, so. say one one, 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 one thing on that. Um, I hope you can hear me. And we can't. I don't hear. Okay. Can you? Can you can't yeah. Hear okay. Me. Then it's just me. Um, is you know, in some ways, I don't even want to give energy to to um, uh, elitist writers' uh, complaints, right? Uh, and uh, it's just like the intellectual dark web, you know. Uh, if you know the intellectual dark web, it's like Jordan Peterson and uh, Joe Rogan, and and it, it's a it's a community of sort of the the irony is that. There's nothing in intellectual about it, and uh, there's nothing dark about it, and they're not even really a web. It's just uh, individualist white male faux intellectuals complaining about their, their lack of voice in the world. And by complaining, they got this huge platform um, to do it. You know, and, and Jordan Peterson, who's a, sort of a mediocre academic um, who who says objectionable things, ends up getting this like very big platform by by sort of complaining about the counterculture, and. Uh, it, it sort of, you know, equality feels like oppression to those who benefit from the current system. And Say it again. I, Say it again, because this uh, is important. Uh, uh, equality feels like oppression to those who are the current beneficiaries of this system. Can right? you make and, an example? Yeah. So, so as as the balance of power starts to shift, um, you know, multiple things happen. Right. W one is that the the sort of um, white male archetype in certain uh, domains has less voice whether that's true or not that's uh, essentially what the internalized victimhood of of the the, the project of whiteness feels so th there's this belief that now we're losing power essentially and there's also you know the the other side to this where where i do have uh, empathy and sympathy is that Usually at the beginning of a counter movement, there is um, an aggression that comes from sort of being repressed and not being able to have your voice heard for a long period of time. And we're seeing this um, in the, the movement for racial justice right now. We, 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 we've, we've seen it in the feminist movement. And look, all ideology has its limitation. For example, we, we should all internalize a feminist worldview and critique of power and understanding of power. It's, it's sort of central as an awake person right now. But uh, a lot of feminism ends up, if it's not coming from a healed ar archetype and there isn't a sort of transmutation of the grief and the trauma gets um, transmutated into anger and hate towards, towards men. And, and the same is tr true with racial justice. The same is true with Marxism. It's true for any ideology. It, so we have to be good students of our culture. We have to understand how power works at this broader culture level and how it's affecting marginalized communities within the broader community of life and, and um, you know, act accordingly. And also know there's gonna be these periods of messiness. And for elite entitled people to complain about those periods of messiness after you know, 500 years of imperialism and genocide, it's just like, it's. I find it ridiculous, you know, um, personally. And I also understand the non-dualistic kind of element of, of what's happening. And to also maybe just connect dots between the things that have been said amongst us, it's, yeah. Can you explain thinking. also that, the non-dualistic, what do you mean by that? Like, so we're, we're in some ways we're, we're being initiated into non-dualistic thought. To be able to hold multiple perspectives simultaneously, often competing perspectives simultaneously. And so um, is there an encroachment on what is considered uh, publicly acceptable dialogue? Perhaps. Um, is there a shadow to uh, marginalized communities now having a voice? Perhaps. Is there um, a sense of white fragility and uh, the fear of entitled people losing the current stronghold they have over power? Absolutely. You know, all of these things are, are, are true and have different and varied degrees of trueness to them. 
and and part of non-duality is also to to accept that there is not one objective truth you know this is what you know quantum physics is teaching us and neuroscience that there there's there's multiple uh subjective truths and what's more important than objective truth is relationality and relationships you know um and so i i, I think what, what's a, what's a key principle maybe to bring up is this idea that all oppression is connected that we can look mm -hmm. at all of these things as single issue areas but they're not single mm -hmm. issue areas right um uh, capitalism is a form of white supremacy a, a certain minority population from western europe who was willing to do um more unsavory things uh in their desire for empire had a 500 year head start on dead based capital and so and through that process enslaved others and uh you know accumulated through dispossession and concentrated wealth and you know all of these things and so of course we're in the economic situation we are and to say that actually what we want is more inclusion for people of color like i, I read a letter from people who work in the advertising industry of color saying they want to have you know a voice at the table and it's like is that really what we want we want more people of color working in the propaganda machinery uh to sell people shit they don't need in an unsustainable economy i don't think so so if we don't have our critique of capitalism and the critique of structure and power central then it's hard for us actually to make any leeway on in all of these interconnected intersectional issues and the same is true for feminism right like exactly. do we want more hillary clintons no do we want more barack obama's no we want people who are or really, in, in, yeah. intersectional imperialism right yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> financial inclusion so we can we like, need more inclusion. female directors of the cia yeah <laughs> yeah so, so I have maybe go no, ahead yeah. no no go ahead i was just gonna kind of i appreciate the kind of um, reflections that are coming up and I kind of just to bring some of these pieces together I'm curious um, and I have some thoughts and maybe we can share some here around um, what what like if we agree and I think I'll know your point is really good that there's kind of an initiation into non-dual thinking like an initiation into holding the both and um, and one of the things I've been sitting with lately is that you know, labeling oneself an anti-capitalist does not tell you anything about what you're in favor of and what you're proposing in those alternative. And I think one of the things that you write about and talk about, Elnor, around um, animism, but specifically relationality to the world as being, if not an explicit antidote, then at least like one element of a transition period. It makes me think about this idea that's been emerging around the just transition and what we're talking, so what we've been talking about over the course of this conversation is systems of oppression and the way that they've impacted us in different ways. And I guess one of the pieces, one of the, the next steps, and I've spent lots of my life in angst and in critique, and I, you know, spent a lot of time continuing to be in angst and to be critical. But one of the pieces that I think is um, emergent and that could be, that I really see, you know, the best aspects of festival culture and the best aspects of kind of progressive or um, future facing culture can offer is what those alternatives are. And I think, you know, thinking about this idea around relationality and the just transition. So for those that aren't familiar, the just transition is the idea that although we can agree that there needs to be shifts from an economic perspective, uh, from a cultural perspective, specifically around how we use resources, how resources are distributed. The concern is specifically that if we don't do that in a just way, we'll just continue to accelerate the discrepancy and the difference between the haves and have nots. Because uh, as they say, uh, if it's not available to the poor, it is neither radical nor revolutionary. So the idea is that we can't just update life and create a cool imaginary future for people who can afford it. We have to do it in a way that's just, we have to transition into this new system in a way that brings everyone along. So one of the um, paradoxes I think that comes up when I'm thinking about critiques of capitalism or critiques of the oil industry or critiques of advertising, that's a great example, is um, 
how we transition people out of those systems and into new ones in a way that doesn't leave people behind. I think advertising might be an easier one because that's just something we should rein back. But when I'm thinking of something like the oil economy, um, I mean, unless someone is going to create the, the whatever the less emission creating vehicle is for eight something billion people, we're gonna like there are people who simply will not be able to afford to transition to better systems of energy right away. And I think that holding, when we're thinking about inclusivity, that we wanna move fast and there's urgency around changing the world, but that urgency is, there's an urgency gap, right? There's There are people who are feeling the urgency and recognize the need for change and there's an experiencing that. And then there are people who are aware that that change is happening, but because they're not experiencing the harm, they don't feel the same urgency, even if they intellectually believe that it's something they need to be thinking about. So engaging with this urgency gap and saying like, well, what's really affecting me? How can I make sure that I'm actually bringing people all along with these visionary changes that I'm making is a critical yeah. part. I want to say here that this pandemic is actually giving us a great chance to feel that mm. urgency, even in our more privileged circles of people. the Europeans. We are all in this together. And this is, I hope, is bringing an awakening in that sense of that sense of urgency and the need to change the system so that it can become release, resilient enough to be able to to weather <laughs> this this kind of huge disruptions that are going to be more and more uh, happening, also connected to climate change and all of that. Peak quarantine moment, I think, for me was watching Madonna in her rose petal bath say, <laughs> we're all in this together. <laughs> we, COVID has been the great democratizer. We're, we're all the same. Um, that was really good. Good uh, but so, <laughs> moment. Thank you for sharing. Um, I would like to say that maybe this is a time when we get into the memento moment. Ivan? Memento moment. Yes. Memento moment. Yeah, we were. I mean, also, also, we're we're we were saying that. Uh, I mean, one one of the ways that we were ther self therapeutizing through this uh, process of being locked up was, you know, because we didn't have like a cloud forest like Mr. Lada um, and as a backdrop. So the ones who were glued to our screens and addicted to the dopamine that was being released by looking at our little smart devices, uh, we were sharing memes, compul memes compulsively. And, uh, and memes, let's be honest, have been a pretty great um, output of the internet. So we've, we've assembled a few, then we wanted to have some like reactions uh, to this also as a moment, like a scheduled moment of levity, because we're also just constantly discussing the system that is essentially a giant meat grinder for our souls. Um, so let's throw up some memes. <laughs> if, uh, if we can, so so this is so so for people who are partic possibly just listening um, or visually impaired, it's a meme that says it's all good, um, and then there's like a Technicolor um, forest and two people, and then one of the people reacts to the it's all good with a speech bubble that says, "Wait, you didn't define it." Commentary. Al-Noor, because he, he spoke before. Um, I love that we're doing uh, mimetic analysis together. Um, so so really, for me, this is the, the, uh, the, the this kind of classic uh, subject-object duality <laughs> right? and, and, and psychedelic moment of, of uh, uh, like, at the highest level, of course, there's unity consciousness and we are all one and you know all, all of that and at the same time we're in different bodies having different experiences and uh we can't spiritually bypass that and pave over that you know and so just like uh honoring the different experiences of uh, of what's happening what it is um and that there will never be an objective truth and that that sort of that that's that sort of let's call it the totalitarian project of science to, to create that mm. is actually not done us any service because science is the floor of understanding, not the ceiling of understanding. You know, we thought the universe was 
a billion years old 50 years ago, and now we think it's 4.4 billion years. It doesn't make it true. It just means that's what we think now. And to really embrace this plurality, because I'd say that, look, if the logic of capitalism is monoculture, right? One way of being, one way of knowing. We all have Apple computers and Nike shoes and listen to Miley Cyrus or Beyonce or whatever corporate capitalism is pushing these days. Um, the, the antidote to that is polyculture. Many ways of knowing, many ways of being, many tons, pluralities. And so, yeah, that's, that's what comes up for me when I see that, that meme. Yeah, I, I'd like to bring in maybe the phrase light washing. Um, some of you might be might have heard it before. You've surely heard the term whitewashing. Lightwashing is really just one of the ways to describe spiritual bypass or like the all one consciousness, right? Like, not, but specifically the belief that because all one consciousness may or may not be true, that our in-person, physical, real life differences may not matter. Um, I have a dear friend that uh, likes to call our bodies the human pet and the idea that we are here <clears throat> taking care of this body and regardless of our ephemeral infinite nature of our actual soul, our bodies look and feel a certain way and are physical. And the idea of saying that because we're all souls, our physical differences don't matter is light washing. That's spiritual bypass. And we've been kind of touching on the idea throughout this process. And, and I think and with this... Mm -hmm. No, and then just to add to that, then the opposite of that is, well, since we're having different experiences and we're all one, we're all God becoming self-aware, why don't mm -hmm. we invest in creating a system that honors us all as co-gods of this you know, evolutionary process? I, I love it. And, and, it, and to the meme, and to the meme, it's like you know, this multicolor, technicolor world that's there. And it's, what I think is funny is like, that this person is like seeing this beautiful scenery and is like, wait a minute, this is not all good. What's it? You know, so it's like there's this way where we can, even even when we can see the difference, we can see the beauty of that difference. I'm where I love that. Like, we kind of have to be present with that and then like, you know, act as if we recognize that difference between people. Great. All right. Okay. Next up. All right. So this is we've got a COVID uh, viral background, <laughs> and uh, the virus is speaking. Nice country you've got there. Would be a shame if I laid bare the cruelty inherent in its very structure. I've been enjoying calling this um, the crisis that's bringing light to the crisis. Um, so to your point, Kiara, in some ways COVID is being seen as a great equalizer because it affects us all equally as a virus. And yet we're already seeing in the United States that the reality of the demographics of people who are being affected are poorer people, are more black and brown people. So it is true that in theory a virus affects everyone, but in real life people live in gated communities and they're able to work from home and they have stable salaries and may or may not be essential workers. So I think that this this meme, it's it's it, it's exactly what it is, right? What it is is that because capitalism has put us into this constant process of moving the gears forward, or else you'll fall behind and not succeed and die and lose everything, because we've been on this grind, the the system has been has, has, we we've we've felt like we've had no choice but to perpetuate the system. COVID has paused some of those pieces because it's and safe to continue some of those aspects. And now people are able to see like, oh wait, this operating system behind all of our grinding is uh, not really working for us either. And I think that that window is part of what allowed the current iteration of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States to really emerge is that people were paused and they weren't um, just working to survive every day because they had to stop for some time. And, and as long as people are working to survive every day, as long as people are stuck in wage slavery and stuck in the system where if they don't work, then they will die, they will lose everything, um, then they're distracted and they're not able to critique and not able to stand up in huge amounts or in huge groups of people and, and call for change. And uh, I would just also jump in there and say that it's not even like the virus doesn't affect people in the same way curatively. It's also all the preemptive stuff, uh, people who can afford healthier food and who can afford leisure time and can exercise and can, they're already building immune systems. 
that are then able to deal with things like this in a much better way than people who are exhausted, depleted, have zero um, mental health support, um, have zero support in terms of good nutrition, are, are living in polluted air. Um, yeah, I was going to say who so, are suffering from environmental racism, all of those pieces. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, cruelty in the inherent inherent in the structure. Next, next meme. I'm I'm not letting everybody speak because we're I, we want to include some questions from people as well. Um, I can't even see this one. Uh, this is the okay. This is tiny. Um, this is the vintage one. It's a vintage yeah, meme. But it's zooming. It's zooming in. All right. So it says it's it's a vintage one, old school, um, like an old school comic cartoon that says not black power not white power but worker power um, and there are people toppling over some statues of a fat corporate industrialist um, that is quite topical uh, funnily enough with the with the decolonizing space through toppling of racist and colonial statues I'll jump on this one. Let's oh, man. Play so, ping, there, ping there, pong. There, there's, so, there's so much to say on, the, on this one on so many different layers, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it quickly. Um, of course, on, on some level, the, whatever context this is from, I, I assume a sort of uh, Marxist era context, um, it's a beautiful call for unification beyond uh, racial lines. And you know the, the project of whiteness and the invention of whiteness not as a, a physical attribute, but as like a cultural project of um, uh, othering and concentrating power uh, was really in direct opposition to the, the class unification that was happening in like the 1600s. So things like the Bacon Revolution that was actually led by uh, a white man, you know, and was seen as a slave revolt. Uh, and, and after that moment, the, the white project starts to, to be not a anti-elite project to say actually the true enemy are those who concentrate power and enslave us but actually each other so that, that that's a very critical kind of historical moment but also to say that like the marxist idea of identification through uh being a worker and a wage slave is also another form of slavery you know and and so how do we go beyond both of these dichotomies and both of these dualities and be like we we are what are we working towards? Well, we are in service to life and the living planet. That's our quote unquote work here. And how do we unite people who are, uh, who are aware of that or increasingly becoming aware of that to, to create a system that reflects our values? Because it's not going to be done through revolution or violence. Um, and we've seen where that's taken us as well. So there, there's so many places to go, but I'll, I'll stop there on that one. Cool. Oh, the places will go. One of my favorite books when I was a kid. And next me. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so this is a pixelated, uh, a pixelated cat playing a synthesizer piano, and it says, "Fun fact: the internet was once a fun place for watching cat videos instead of monitoring the real-time collapse of late-stage capitalism." I feel a little bit polarized uh, about in my response to this one because first off, I love cat videos and I also um, am experiencing schadenfreude with the monitoring of the <laughs> late stage capitalism at the same time. Um, and I think it kind of goes a bit, it makes me think of like a bit of what I was talking about earlier regarding the, I don't know if democratization is necessarily the right word, but certainly the flattening of access to media um, and this is a collapse. Like, I, I wonder, you know, I wonder what, I don't know if the situation we're in would it be possible without social media, but I'm trying to imagine the hypothetical world where this collapse was happening without it. If we were still where we were, you know, a few decades ago with only mainstream media, with only mainstream newspapers. Um, and I, I'm grateful as much as I understand why people are feeling kind of really wrecked and overwhelmed by the input that they're getting from the internet. I know I am regarding the constant barrage of reality. Um, the truth is that access to video, <laughs> access to kind of um, video technology and the internet is a big part of what's, what's, what's forcing, I think, the hand of um, some of the systemic actors. Like the reality is that we know that 
police brutality and police murder may be happening in the United States all the time, it's, uh, we, we get to see that. I mean, this is the brutal truth. Like we are able to see that because of the shift in media and technology that's occurred over the last years. So yes, we're monitoring the class, but at least we're monitoring it. For a long time, there was no one monitoring. It was just the people who were doing it and the people who were there, who they were distracting. And of course there have always been freedom fighters. I'm not trying to say that because we have the internet, we know more, you know, there's people throughout history who have fought with the knowledge that they have. Um, but I'm kind of glad that people can see it. People should be able to see the fall of empire bit by bit, every ugly part. And this is going to be our last meme, so I'm going to also pass the baton to Alnor if he wants to say anything about cat videos or potentially late stage capitalism. No, I, I think I think we said enough uh, about cat videos and late stage capitalism. Um, I totally agree with Izzy on that as well. Um, yeah, do, do we open it up to qu questions or what's our time like? So, yes, I would actually like to address the first question that we got and I know it's actually directed to you and I think it's important also to introduce this uh, like this deeper look because at the beginning uh, Ivan said wow you are you you are living uh, hippies wet dream there in Costa Rica living the the life of the visionary that puts in practice his vision and the question that came is um, what are the relationships like with indigenous people in Costa Rica and ethical considerations around land appropriation by foreigners? I'm sure you have considered this point already. So what are your reflections about it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and, and maybe just to say the, the preface of, uh, it's, it's not that we have figured anything out, right? We're in an inquiry. Uh, around uh, how to live and how to create experiments outside of the system. And um, that's a constant process. Um, you know, there's an old line, I forgot who said it, but it's call some place paradise and kiss it goodbye. As soon as you think you've arrived anywhere, you know, uh, like Nietzsche's definition of consciousness was the perpetual non-arrivalness of reality. Um, and, and so that's the kind of practice we're in. Um, so, you know, Costa Rica uh, has a decimated indigenous population, um, very small uh, indigenous community left here, less than 5% of the population. Um, and it was really a traveling route uh, and, a, and a trading path for uh, um, Incas from the south and uh, Mayans and Zapotecs and others from the north. Uh, and so, there isn't a strong indigenous uh, culture here the, uh, the way there is in, let's say, Guatemala uh, to the north, right, which is 80% Mayan indigenous. Um, and so really the, the, the kind of, the people of this land are rural indigenous campesinos and, and smallholder farmers. And so our, uh, my, my partner is, is, is Costa Rican. And when we come to a place like this, um, you know, our, our kind of models that we're bringing are actually in some ways informed by the Latin American model. And so we, we bought a piece of land and put it into a trust. And we say we don't believe in ownership of private property, but stewardship. And just even signaling that to our neighbors has a, has a huge effect. Um, we don't believe in the concentration of wealth or certain people should benefit from having a head start on capital. So we run all the, the, the kind of economic activity through a cooperative ownership and so anybody that works on the land uh, is a partner in the land and so there's no distinction between labor and capital in the traditional way so if you work in the farm or in the kitchen or whatever you're part of that both decision making and and profit sharing which uh, is also radical because um, everyone has been colonized by globalization especially the people of this area um, and they're, they're put in competition against each other to sell their 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 farming goods and so to create co cooperative models is very radical and very powerful and also very simple uh, and people inherently understand it. And then also from a building perspective, like we're not uh, imposing sort of steel and concrete and glass, uh, which is the common way to build all over the, the country and, and the continent, but we do natural building. We build with rammed earth and bamboo. We do biomimetic architecture, which is you copy the, the designs of nature 
we do biophilic designs, um, and we build very simply and very humbly. And so actually the, the way we live here is often um, seen as a kind of less appealing than the, the way most people live in this area. Uh, and, and there's also something beautiful about that. Um, and so those are just some of the ways, you know, and, and we're also in active dialogue with the community uh, all the time. We, we have a community project that, uh, called uh, uh, More Love Force, where we go around to different people's communities um, and different people's houses within the community and ask them what they need and try to help plant vegetable gardens and build walls. And, you know, we do that uh, 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 a couple of points during the month because the, our aim is really to create strong bioregions, you know, and, and also not to create a doomsday opt-out community where we have any answers, but to create a model that's replicable. You know, the desire of the sort of Western innovation mindset is scale. How do you make things bigger? And our mindset is more of like replicability. How do we make things in a way that's uh, open source and accessible and cheap to build and creates food sovereignty and self-sufficiency? So those are just some of the lenses, yeah, we bring. So I would uh, change my previous statement and say you're living the hippies' wet dream. Um, Str struggling hippies, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna uh, pass this over to Kiara because I am not able to access. Okay, so so I would say the next one is this one that says it seems like there is a huge shift happening right now from individual to systems thinking. Why now? What? what all is coming together i mean i think the question here is why is it happening now this shift in perspectives and how do you see this evolving from here like what can be the next phase or the next steps after this moment of recognition this increase of awareness is it a tipping point I'll say a quick thing. Um, I'm sure we all have lots of thoughts about it. Um, well, the first piece I think has to do with the um, empowerment, ironically, of the individual voice in the face of these larger systems, which is kind of, again, going to this question about who has access to media. Um, Al Noor, in one of your recent articles of, for Double Blind, you wrote, there is a responsibility that comes with being a co-creator of reality. And I like that because I think that what's occurring is that while over the last decades there's been kind of this push to reduce democratization, to reduce the people's belief that they have an influence on the system that they're living in, um, there's kind of a feedback loop where as people get more voice and are able to make more change, um, that actually strengthens. So I think that it is true and, and again, part of seeing everything, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, or all the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, also comes with a level of empowerment. Um, you see this on the flip side with like the conspirituality movement where you have people who are like becoming aware, but they're becoming aware of like highly specific kind of conspiracy-based frameworks instead of the very real horrible things that are happening all day, every day that are sometimes related. Um, and I think that that empowerment overall, although I'm, you know, it kind of cuts in both ways, like I was saying, is a good thing and I think is leading to some of this tipping point. I think that the, the, there is something happening with how we think about monoculture and counterculture. Um, I feel like it's a fractaling or a fracturing where I think that the, um, and this is coming with the collapse of empire, like part of empire is the um, kind of lionization of a specific or the the elevation of a specific kind of idea, the white picket fence worldview, you might call it. Um, and I think that the, 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 honestly, the fact that the United States has been perpetually disappointing to the rest of the world for a long time, increasingly, I think, is leading to um, a realization that the reliance that we've put on empire to move society forward, to like drive our innovation and drive our competition and drive our advancement, is um, a false prophet and that we've been putting all of our energy into the belief of this institution or this um, this imperial kind of project. 
and witnessing it collapse around us. And I think that although on one hand, I can see why people would, there's a lot of grief and a lot of despair that should and does come with that. There's also the belief that things can be done differently. And I think that one of the things that I've learned from um, people like Adrian Murray Brown and Emergent Strategy and this conversation about the way that Afrofuturism and imaginary, imaginal practice can be utilized in activism is to think about how this is a battle of the imaginations. Like we are, um, we, we have to believe that we can imagine a world, we have to imagine and believe that a world without violence is possible to even want to fight for it. A lot of people don't believe it's even possible because it's just always how we've been. The same thing with patriarchy. One of the reasons I appreciate your work, Yada, is because you've been spending years now trying to study the origin of patriarchy. If it's before Christianity, if it's before this, where does that come from? It's an interesting question because, you know, these pieces aren't always like trackable to a single origin. But I think that as we learn more about where they could come from, we learn that they are not things that are part of our biological genetic programming and that these are things that we created just like debt, just like all of these other mechanisms. Now it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine it. Like, like the divine right of Kings, right? It's hard to imagine that it could be different, but I think we are in a battle of imagination and we are in a battle of trying to do that. And I think people are becoming empowered to have an imagination and our imaginations are coalescing into something potentially really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And maybe just to add a few thoughts to that is, you know, there's so many ways to, to answer the question of, of why now. You, you could look at it from an evolutionary perspective, a generational perspective, a, a spiritual perspective. But to, to say, you know, the, the context has changed, right? So um, I think Wendell Berry says we're, we're a species out of context. And our, our choice is our choice set is very different than our parents' generation. You know, their job was uh, get comfortable work, stability, raise a family, whatever that generational uh, project of the boomers was. And our choice set is really, we either um, join the, 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 the insurrection uh, or we will be the last human beings left or our children will be the last human beings left. And so that shift in context is, is shifts it really shifts everything and we're also re realizing that privilege is a constraint and so the con it's sort of constraining us to see and so all of these things we've accumulated where we're now a cycle is shifting where we're actually realizing we need to to have less do less consume less you know there, there's we're becoming more aware of the consequences of our actions which is the true definition of being awake, like the wake of a ship, the, 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 the waves that fan out. And, um, and then there's the cultural evolutional, evolutionary aspect, which is uh, after the 5,000 year project of the city state and uh, totalitarian agriculture and pulling from the land and extracting, and we, we, we have this pause moment, not, not just, not just this, this current moment, but this ability for self-reflexivity, where we look back and we look around us and we survey the damage and the destruction and the acidification of the oceans and 200 species dying a day and mass poverty and mass inequality. And we're like, this is just not working. And the internet is fueling that in some level because we can be more aware of that. Our kind of relational tissue amongst each other is deeper, even though we feel more atomized than we've ever felt before. And I think uh, the paradox of all of this is the beginning of wonder. And, and this is where we're moving to the, uh, the old answers we've been told no longer satisfy awake, curious people. And that's the perfect recipe for, for uh, radical, structural, um, cultural change. And so we, we're going from this kind of idea of, of sort of rationalism to a more animistic worldview, you know, seeing the universe as alive. And then our science is catching up with indigenous knowledge, which is then sort of reinforcing to the skeptical mind that possibility that enlightenment logic is, is falling away and, and the kind of more of an enchantment culture is, is happening. And psychedelics are feeling that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going from sort of 
uh, this very individualistic unit of rationality to this more uh, feeling our immensity through the spiritual revolution that's happening and the merger of all these uh, sort of spiritual, religious, cultural uh, uh, practices, yoga, ayahuasca, uh, you know, even the new age movement plays a role in that, uh, uh, the popularity and rise of shamanism. And, and so it's, it's just this perfect cultural moment. And there's, I, I don't think there's necessarily an answer of why, but it's more of an effect of being at the edge of consciousness near the, the sort of end of history, if you will. I think it would be cool, even though we're running a bit over time, to just include a couple more voices. And this is why, just so that we can include a couple more voices, I would encourage brevity uh, in answers. Uh, we have Renan, who said, how do we radically change minds when too many people believe in meritocracy? I would also ask for a very quick definition of meritocracy. Either one, jump in. You want to go with me? Well, we can quickly define meritocracy, which is the belief that um, there's an equal playing field. And if everyone just does good by what the system says, then somehow there will be some uh, equilibrium. And it, it's, it's basically an ahistorical perspective. It doesn't take into account all the things that have sort of gotten us to this point and the fact that, uh, you know, yeah, about a handful of mostly white Western males have more wealth than uh, 3.5 billion human beings combined. And so, uh, okay, we know the merit system works. Well, what then do we do is essentially the question. And I'd say this is the, there's a process that's happening right now, which is, which is um, actively disidentifying from our culture and from the dominant system and being really good students of our culture, really understanding how capitalism works, understanding the illusion of meritocracy understanding the, the, the lies of the invisible hand. That's part of our spiritual work and practice as the generation that's inheriting the planet and the generations that are inheriting this planet. I'd say a second aspect of that is um, uh, transcending the fear of dualism, transcending the fear of judgment, actually like putting our stake in the ground and saying this is what we believe in and why, and not just what we want to build, but what we no longer will accept anymore. And I think part of that is, is embracing the contradiction and the complexity and the messiness and the ambiguity of our current moment. There's nobody that's outside our current system. Like my clothes are probably made in sweatshops. Our farm truck is using fossil fuels. Just because we critique the system, it doesn't mean we're above it. We're all enmeshed in it. And what capitalism wants to do is make us sort of um, have this sort of clean linearity you know, you're, you're either Gandhi or you're a Goldman Sachs banker. And, you know, the transition is going to be so much more complex than that. And so the way we, we take the system down is we actively critique it. We see our complicity in it. And we try to embody those post-capitalist post values of empathy and altruism and interdependence and solidarity and... Um, yeah, this, this animistic worldview. And, and with that comes being in dialogue with the living planet and being in a spiritual practice that allows you to, to touch the divine and touch the more than human world. I have, well, gonna, I have, I just wanted to say that I have been gleefully okay. watching the end of meritocracy, the collapse of meritocracy. If you are watching the leadership of the United States government right now and continue to believe in meritocracy, I'm not exactly sure what else can possibly convince you. That's pretty much where I would start. Um, and like, you know, not to be um, glib about it, but um, the only people who believe in merit, really believe in meritocracy are people who have um, been lied to internal and internalized those lies. Um, and I think to Alnur's point much earlier around the Stockholm syndrome, like what it means to be assimilating into American culture and assimilating into Western or the culture of the global North. Um, a lot of that has to do with this myth of meritocracy. Um, and it is true that the, that idea has led to people pursuing excellence in certain ways. Um, but if you're looking at it from like a macro perspective, especially when it comes to global leadership, um, the collapse seems imminent um, 
if not already happening. And I think that what that will give rise to is this kind of option of relation relationality and not just merit within the context of this like binary system that's been created to define what, me what merit is, but actually to be in integrity with oneself and with this your ecosystem and with your spiritual practice and kind of your, your surroundings. And I think that th there's a different, it's kind of playing by different rules, right? Maybe there's an aspect of merit that you can utilize to describe it, but it's not according to the current hierarchy or the, the hierarchy that's been kind of managing the system so far. Hmm. I mean, going back to our, it's all good. It's like we, it merits all good. You didn't define merit. Um, and I feel like it, the people whose ego is going to be too bruised um, if they accept that they have been scaffolded by injustice um, and a very rigged deck of cards um, are going to have the hardest time um, accepting that meritocracy is an illusion. Um, Kara, what do you think in terms of time? We go with the last question. But which one? By These Francis T, the last, last. Could you go into pluralism a bit more and how it differs from both there is one right system of thinking and everything is purely subjective related? I think this is a good example of initiation into dual thinking because like, how do you combine the both aspects in one uh, bigger system? That doesn't oppress or more than two. <laughs> yeah. You want to start? I can give a quick. Yeah, I can start. Um, so I like the word pluralism. It came up a lot in like the post 9/11. We should just you know to like tolerance era where we were just like we have to tolerate each other. That was like my kind of first contact with this idea of pluralism. That there are many voices and there are um, many ways to accept uh, kind of different perspectives. Um, the word, maybe another word I'll bring in here is perennialism or perennial philosophy, which is the idea that multiple paths can lead to the same outcome. Um, it's often applied to religiousness or spirituality. The idea that perennial theology is the idea, as Rumi says, that there are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground, that every path leads to the top in different ways. So when I'm thinking about pluralism, I'm thinking both of this acceptance of the perennial philosophy that... Um, the value judgment that we attach to difference is an illusion that we create and that in reality these different perspectives um whether or not we believe or actually want to follow them or believe that they will take us to the same place that they should be accepted um i do want to give a caveat to that because and this is like really well seen in for example the difference between how europe and the united states think about free speech um if you tolerate both people who are being abused and people who are abusers, then only the people who are abusers actually get power in that room, right? So there's a level where you have to, that, that pluralism or tolerance does have boundaries when it actually encroaches upon the rights or safety of other people. Um, but I think how we define safety and how we think about um, to, w when does an idea become dangerous? When does it become more than just an idea? And I think just to kind of close this brief response, I would offer that it has to do with what is being said relative to what is being done. So if um, someone is uh, calling for harm or, or saying or doing something that is oppressive or bigoted, there's this idea of punching up versus punching down, you know, going after people with power, or people without power. And I think when it comes to things like pluralism, we have this idea that like everyone, like the, 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 the shadow side, the light washing version of it is that even people with power also deserve to be tolerated. Of course, we should make sure not to forget the voices of the rich and powerful because they shouldn't, they shouldn't lose ground as we bring more to other people. And on some levels, I believe that this is, a, this is not a zero sum game, that there's room for every voice. And I recognize that um, pluralism only works if you're able to acknowledge that some boundaries must be set for every voice to actually be heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll say, because um, this, this, this conversation is also very much entangled in the idea of uh, objective truth. And um, a friend of mine, uh, Bayo Akomalafe, he, he said this great line the other day. He said, um, facts are not enough to tell the true account of anything. 
facts are not enough to tell the true account of anything. That you know, even the scientific method, it's based on five senses. And so there's always going to be a limitation. This doesn't mean that, uh, this is not, I'm not promoting a relativism, that everyone can believe everything and that's okay. R rather, it's a relationalism. You know, uh, there's a line by, by David Abrams in The Spell of the Sensuous, where he says, um, there is no objective truth, there's only the quality of your relationships. So through dialogue and through relationship, uh, we come to a shared understanding of our consensus reality. And, and that's why I think um, uh, animism is such a, a, a richer, more interesting worldview than, than uh, materialism. You know, that, that, that the idea that the universe is uh, dead matter, essentially, that we can, we can understand uh, in some objective way. And the idea of sort of linear time has to give way to more of a cyclical time. And the idea of like this uh, objective observer has to give way to more of a kind of involved participant. And, and, and that's how you bring in plurality because you're, you're bringing in other voices and other tongues and other ways of knowing and being into your understanding of what this subjective collective hallucination is about. I mean, there's, there is uh, a little subsection that is trying to integrate this and it's poetic naturalism. And uh, a poetic naturalism just tries to do this, tries to look at relationality as a dynamic way of doing science and acknowledging that it's just the best account we have right now with all the subjectivities inherent in it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I like it. And, and um, it requires a humility. There, there's a, it's a humility instead of hubris, you know, sort of dialogue instead of domination, like omnicentric worldview instead of uh, anthropocentric worldview. And this since is, we've gone all over, oh, sorry, go ahead. That just to say, this is a great point where we can wrap. We are really coming mm -hmm. to this beautiful, <laughs> we are really coming to this sequence of beautiful points. So even like bringing I mean, home, I, I bringing vision, bringing a possibilities for something different than what we don't like about the status quo, say. I, I did like the fact that Ryan Miller asked us about thoughts from NACO and Medicine of the People. And as a music festival, I think the cool thing that music festivals can do is become both more political, um, more open to the relationality and dialogue, more pluralistic in what they offer. Um, because we that, like, this is also the container that's bringing us here together. And if music festivals and art festivals and these collective institutions do more of this, um, what we're doing today, and that breaks off and more people do it in all of their constellations of friends, um, which is why we also decided to do this with friends. Hopefully there is a certain level of contagion that can mean that this ripples out and more people can, yeah, have these conversations and hopefully get to a better place than they were at yesterday. So I'm wondering if to wrap up, we each want to say something that we've learned from this con discussion, if there is a new insight that we had, if we can just get there, even if I'm always a believer into the time to settle, to let the energy the, and the information settle down to then come up with some conclusions. But considering that we are already a bit over time, is there something that you can share that you, something new that came out of this conversation? Um, maybe I'll say, uh, I, I'm contemplating this idea of why now, you know, why at this point in, in cultural, spiritual, evolutionary history, why has Gaia and the, the entelechy of the living planet chosen this moment? For, for, for this transition. And I don't think there's an answer to it, but I'm, I'm gonna sit in contemplation with that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I kind of have a similar place where um, 
kind of like what was said earlier, it's really hard to just point to a single cause and to understand like, what is it that's synergizing these different pieces? Um, but I guess for, for this conversation, I feel like I learn so much every time I talk with y'all, but I think that, um, well, one piece is the idea of not just the interrelation of these different systems of oppression, but the way that they kind of insidiously um, trick us into kind of forgetting that we are participating in them. And I think as someone who is, um, you know, born, born male and socialized that way, um, the, this idea that, you know, it's come up before, but I think that we talked about it today around unlearning is something that I think I'll be sitting with and I'm constantly kind of reflecting on the idea of learning and unlearning and um, the extent to which unlearning is a form of other learning. Um, and I think that that's one piece that I, I want to just bring forward. Um, and I think before I, before like signing off, I also just want to say that, you know, we were talking a little bit about, um, unity consciousness and how psychedelics can offer kind of ways into, uh, different perspectives. Um, but I feel like I can't end this conversation without saying, because we're talking about systems of oppression, the dark side of that, for people that don't know the story of Elijah McClain, um, he was a young black. Um, boy who was um, recently also killed in an interaction with police, uh, but specifically through a cardiac arrest after being forcibly injected with 500 milligrams of ketamine, um, something that was coerced by, the, or by, that was requested by the law enforcement and done by the medics. And I bring that case up, Elijah McClain, if you're not familiar with it, people who are, you know, um, really into psychedelics and healing to look into it because it is true that these substances have the have the possibility to offer so much uh, consciousness and growth to us as individuals. But um, I don't think we can talk about oppression without saying that these these uh, tools and practices, like the idea of meritocracy and all of these systems, um, can and are used against us and to oppress. Um, and that kind of goes to this like uh, binary or not both binary and non-dual perspective that we've been having around oppression in general um, and the way that we've benefited, but also the ways that, that we've been harmed. So I guess I'll just end by saying that, th that, that, that the non-dual aspect is something that I'm always sitting with. And I feel like I was able to gain some more shades of that over the course of this conversation. So. I was able to re-remember that as a host, you get to listen way more and you get to learn way more. And I am in the point of uh, this concept of relational and to turn it from a concept into daily exchanges. What does it look like? And I'm also really into understanding how does relation, the relationship can affect my contact with animals, for example, like meeting a dog or meeting a cat or meeting a horse. And I'm like, because it, it comes up so much as a crucial fundamental point where we are learning something new and we see that that's a direction in which we need to go because we've lost this relation relationality, even across different species and not in, in between us. So yeah, I'm gonna fill in everything that has been said connected to that. And yeah, in this point, I'm afraid that we need to wrap because we went over time. I mean, we discussed so many incredible, important points and you brought so much inspiration to so many different um, twists and turns of these stories that we mentioned. So I really want to express my deep gratitude to Izzy, to Al-Nur, to my colleague, <laughs> Ivan, co-pilot, <laughs> pirate so in psychedelic mischief. And <laughs> I mean, the people that we need to thank are so many. You know who you are, all the people in the Boom team. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for opening these spaces, for conversations, for dialogue, for looking at each other and learning from each other. And um, yeah, I hope we will have more. I hope also this was the first uh, that we will always remember. And from here we can 
shape shift, adapt, uh, evolve, and uh, possibly being also more inclusive of the people at home. I feel there is a point where we can uh, um, be mindful of that and uh, be mindful of uh, the way we speak and the words that we use and not to only address uh, the nerd community. Please send us your feedback about that. We would really like to hear it. Please send feedback to social media at boomfestival.org. I think Riley can write this down in the, um, in the chat box. And I also want to thank the UNITE platform, all the members of the UNITE uh, um, network. Thank you so much for opening your doors to this conversation. And I hope even there, there can be more. And yeah, Ivan, do you want to say something new? I want to say thank you, Chiara, for doing all the thank yous, knowing that I hate doing thank yous. <laughs> and uh, everybody who's in the Northern Hemisphere, enjoy summer. Everybody who's in the Southern, enjoy winter. Everybody who's in the middle, enjoy the fluid, beautiful, messy middleness. Uh, go outside, I don't know, read a book, climb a palm tree, eat a palm date, do things <laughs> with palm trees. Um, don't do palm oil. And uh, just to throw in a quote from good old Terrence, Take it easy, <laughs> but take it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Ciao, Thank ciao. You Thanks so much, yeah, Omnur and Chiara and Ivan and everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. See you soon, hopefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm.